CJ, we might be like the, the last men standing, really, as pastors. I feel like all my friends have resigned. I, I, I thought about it, but then everybody resigned, and then I'm like, you kind of forced me to stay, because it looks weird if I do, too. Uh, no, it, it has been a crazy, crazy few years, but I believe, um, just to be all honest, I actually was on the verge of resigning, uh, and I went on a six-month sabbatical and came back, and I began um, leading the church through a 22-day, 6 a.m. Bible study through Psalm 119, so every day, seven days a week. Um, and while I was praying through that, I just remember the Lord kind of putting on my heart, you know, you asked everybody else what you thought you should do, what they thought you should do, but you never asked me. Um, and I, it was like a kind of a comical moment where the Lord sort of just said, how many times do I have to vomit you back up on the shores of Portland before you get it? Um, and I'm like, all right, you win, Jesus, you always do. Um, we love the city. Um, we feel called to it. Darcy and I are born, uh, born and raised in the Northwest. I grew up in Longview, Kelso. Uh, she grew up uh, just outside of Portland in Aurora, Oregon. Um, I lived in Seattle in my 20s, a non-believer. Darcy lived here in Portland uh, as a non-believer. And yes, we met at the Satyricon, which is in, it's in Chinatown. Uh, and it was where Kurt Cobain met Courtney Taylor, and it was closed like three years ago. And when I met her, um, neither of us were believers, uh, and I was wearing full makeup. I, I like literally was like Ziggy Stardust. Um, and I still look just as suspect today. I, I understand that. Um, <clears throat> and we were like, your pastor has a gold front tooth and a throat tattoo? I don't know if that's okay. Um, I don't either. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but we fell madly in love, and I came to faith first at 27, and Darcy two years later, uh, and it literally, um, classic, I, I, my first uh, ministry job was at Calvary Chapel uh, in Spokane, Washington. Um, we were living in Seattle, and I got a call from Calvary, and before I knew it, I was a, now a pastor. I'd been a believer for just over two years, and my wife had been a believer for six months. I'm like, I don't know in general, I don't generally recommend that's how you hire people. Um, but we were baptized by fire, uh, and it was, it's been a beautiful, a beautiful run. Uh, telecast, uh, my first record, Beauty of Simplicity, I just got a little note that said it came out 20 years ago last month, and it made me feel so old, so old. So uh, I am a blessed man, um, and I would honestly say that life didn't really begin to be exciting until I met Jesus at 27. Um, we have been partners at Door of Hope um, with First Image since it began, uh, and I'm really passionate about this ministry. First of all, I'm Gen X, so Gen X are contrarians. You know, millennials and younger, like, your gift is irony uh, and, and um, sarcasm. And I, and I always say, like, man, I'm, I kind of, I'm ready for a little Gen X again, because, you know, at least we hated ourselves. Uh, <laughs> Um, but it, 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 my generation, we're contrarians. You tell me to do something, I'm gonna do the exact opposite. So the, like, don't start a church in Portland, nobody survives there. I'm like, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not lying, when I started Door of Hope, you know, social justice movements were so, everybody was talking about, everyone was asking me, what are you gonna do to serve the city? How are you gonna make a difference in the city? There was like churches doing like neighborhood gardens and trying to stop sex trafficking and all these things. And all these things were good. But I remember being struck by the fact that social causes uh, have uh, what I call sex appeal. Uh, and the conversation around abortion had become not so sexy. Uh, in fact, we don't wanna do anything at our church that might you know, bring uh, the wrath of a progressive city like Portland down on our heads. Uh, so we're just going to avoid first image, but we got to do something so we feel okay about ourselves. Uh, and I, that contrarian in me, I'm like, no, we're going to support first image. That's awesome. Uh, because we should care, because life matters, uh, and people hurt and need to know that they're loved. And so I want to just you know, simply say it out of, the, out of the gate, I am so grateful for what first image has done for the countless women, even women at Door of Hope, uh, that uh, we've... Dorf Hope was a church that exploded with new believers, 
primarily between the age of 20 and 25 in the first five years. I think I did 75 weddings. And there were two girls that got pregnant at Door of Hope um, over the years. That first image was the, the loving, grace-filled intervention that was necessary uh, for right decisions to be made. But first image has also been a place of comfort for people who have made decisions that they regret. And I want you to know that as Christians, that's our heart, is that it's grace. God can take anything, even things that we have done that we're like, how could God ever forgive me for that? His grace is, is the reminder that his love toward us is truly the one-way love of God. He loves you not because you're lovable, but because it's his nature to do so. And only grace is, grace is the only real motivation for any real transformation in a person's life. Um, and so I just want to say that I believe this ministry is crucial to our city. It's crucial to our churches. Uh, and in a, in a time in which people feel more disconnected, more isolated than ever before, it's ministries like this that remind us of one incredible truth that Scripture declares right in the beginning of the Bible. It's not good that man be alone. We need one another. And you here tonight serve an incredible purpose in being a support to a ministry that can help many, many people make good decisions around incredible questions of family and purpose and all of these things uh, that, that this ministry has its hands in. It's not just about helping someone make a decision not to have an abortion. It's about helping people see that they are loved and valued and that the life they are carrying is loved and valued because we serve a God who loves us because it's his nature to do so. And that's a beautiful and incredible uh, weight um, and gift. So I hope you feel both the weight and the gift of it. You know, my mom and my wife's um, mother, um, they both had us uh, as teenagers. Uh, my mom had me when she was 18. Uh, my wife's uh, mother, uh, my mother-in-law, Melody, had Darcy when she was she was 16. Um, both of our moms grew up in a time where that was an incredible embarrassment to a family uh, for a young girl to get pregnant. And so often abortion was encouraged or have your baby somewhere where the town won't see you and then give it up for adoption. Um, and both of our moms chose not only to have us, but to keep us. And I think of the incredible sacrifice that was made for teenage girls to give up their future and school and all these things to become mamas. Um, but the gratitude that is felt, and I, would, and I know both of them would say they would not make any other decision than the ones that they made um, because I'm actually that awesome. That's what my mom said, no. <laughs> because life is a gift. Uh, and, and I just, I think about, I can't, I mean, my mom, 18, is one thing, but I think about Melody getting pregnant at 15 um, and, and giving birth to Darcy and being a, a married mother at 16 years old. It's hard for me to get my head around, especially since my daughter uh, right now is 17, and I don't think she would be ready for that. Um, but the human heart is incredibly resilient. So I think I have a, and I grew up with a single mom and I grew up in deep poverty. Um, so I see the necessity of ministries like this because when you live in a world where um, you have nothing and, uh, and you have these voices uh, saying that the only way to survive is to make, uh, make decisions that will not hinder your privacy, your personhood, um, and it's the great lie of society that we don't need anyone uh, and that every decision we make the right decision is the selfish decision that will hopefully help me get out of whatever situation I'm in. Um, that is an incredible lie, um, one that I believed for years until I met Jesus. And I think that this is, a, um, this is something that, that is, is worth uh, not only investing in, but thinking through as a community. Right now, we have a city that is hurting in ways that I haven't ever seen it hurt before. And I believe with that comes unbelievable opportunity. Uh, someone asked me, how are you handling being a pastor in Portland? I'm like, I think it's the ultimate place to be a pastor right now. It's post-Christian. People don't have a background in the church, so they're actually not nearly as offended by Christianity as you might think. Uh, they, they may be indifferent, but they're weirdly open to it. A man was texting me tonight uh, who I met at a restaurant 
and he liked my tattoos, and, and he asked if I gave tattoos, and I said, I'm a pastor, and he literally, I just saw a text, I think I'm ready to surrender to Jesus, just now. <laughs> That's the city we live in. <laughs> I couldn't have asked for a better illustration. I mean, this is, this is where, it's one of the few moments where like a text while I'm preaching was like, wow, thank you, Jesus. That was just like, a, here, Josh. I don't know if he's like, you're not doing good. Here, take this. <laughs> My gift to you. <laughs> There's a passage um, that I immediately thought of when um, I was asked to speak here, especially when I was given the theme. And I think about, uh, I remember when, uh, when the clinic was uh, down and just the call, can, can churches help? Um, and I'm, it's so amazing to see it rebuilt. But the passage that I've always been um, struck by is from Isaiah chapter 45, uh, verse 3. It's a mysterious passage um, in which uh, there is this, this combination of both judgment and mercy um, coming through the prophet Isaiah toward Israel. But there is a movement toward promise and mercy and covenant and remembrance. But he says this mysterious thing through the prophet. In Isaiah 45, 3, he says, and I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. Treasures of darkness. I don't know about you, but uh, there's, a, there's something a little bit ominous about that statement. I'm gonna give you treasures of darkness. And I, and I believe what God is saying is that, is that there are going to be things that happen um, that you are not going to understand. There are gonna be things that even on the surface may seem painful or may seem like I don't have your best at heart. But the fact is, is that what I'm actually doing is I'm bringing about the best possible, uh, the best possible outcome in spite of your continued rebellion, in spite of the world turning its back on me, I am going to continue to be a God that redeems, a God that saves. Now, what I want to stay out of the, um, here at the beginning is this. It's often easy to talk about the providence of God, is that that means that everything that happens is something that was determined by um, by God, you know, in some sort of secret room, you know, in the heavenly places. Um, and we're just left to wonder why God would choose to do these things to us. And I think it's a very dangerous thing to apply anything to God that scripture says, the, the contrary of it says that in God, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That God does not bring about evil, but Scripture says that God is Lord and that he is sovereign. And his sovereignty doesn't mean that he determines everything that happens. His sovereignty means that he has the freedom to override, utilize, commandeer, repurpose, and bring about something beautiful out of the ugly. Have you guys ever read the book, The Silmarillion by J.R. Token? Anyone, anyone read that? I just wanted to see how many real nerds there were here. <laughs> And there's just a few, literally just a few of us. Yes, because it is a long epic poem and relatively unreadable to most people. Um, but there's a profound, um, you know, Token was obsessed with uh, mythologies and, and he, he gives Middle Earth its own cosmology, its own origin story, but it's deeply uh, informed by a scriptural understanding of creation. And in the creation story of Middle Earth, the creator God is creating by singing creation into existence. And he's singing a song through these other kind of angelic sort of semi-God characters that are uh, carrying the song into, this, into what would become Middle Earth. But one of these creatures, one of these demigods, becomes aware of himself and a dissonant note immediately enters into the creation song, threatening this creation. Then others begin to notice that this person's noticing himself, and they also, before you know it, all of these dissonant notes have entered into the creation song, and it, now the entire creation order is turning back to chaos, and it looks like the creation might be done. 
But what does the creator, the one true God do? He doesn't start over. No, he takes those dissonant notes and he breathes a new movement, a new melodic movement that incorporates that note, those notes and brings about something even more profound and more beautiful. I think Token actually understood uh, one of the great mysteries of scripture. And that is this, is that suffering is a mystery that cannot be cracked. We're, not, we're never gonna know why we hurt. I don't know why the serpent's in the garden, he's just there. And honestly, I don't care. I just want to know that God cares and that he's done something about it. So what I wanna know is the one that crushed the serpent's head. That's what matters to me. I don't need to know why I hurt, I just need to know that, jo that Jesus cares about my suffering and has entered into that suffering and that he has the ability to take even the dumbest things that we do as human beings. Because listen, it doesn't change anything to be saved when it comes to the fact that life is still mixture. And what I mean by that is even if you're born again and spirit filled, you still have this unfortunate reality that is that you live in sinful bodies with sinful minds in a sinful world. And all of creation groans and is awaiting its redemption. And to be born again means that the spirit now is commandeering our sinful bodies and sinful minds to bring about good. But that mixture is always at play. It's always there. I always say that when, the longer I walk with Jesus, I don't sin less. I seem to be actually more painfully aware of how sinful I am. I mean, I can't go anywhere in Portland without trying to kill someone on a bicycle. It's just, <laughs> it's what I do on the side for fun. And I just need to confess that because I ran two people. I did not, I did not, but I have, I actually did run a man off the road once on a Sunday morning and we might've even exchanged hand signals. Um, and, uh, um, and then I got to the, and I'm not going to tell you what I mean by that. If you didn't laugh, um, uh, but I got to the church and I went in to get ready to preach. And then I stepped outside and I saw the bike in the bike rack. And what do you do then? What do you do with that? It's the real question of integrity, isn't it? So I said, Hey, I just want you guys to know, I saw, I almost ran a cyclist off the road today and we exchanged some, some physical gestures that were inappropriate for either of us. Um, and I'm really sorry about that. And I think you might be here. Um, but I also want to just take this opportunity to let you know that you should never ride in the middle of the road. <laughs> the bike lane was one block over. You had no business being there. And so if you want to get up and apologize to everyone, I'm going to let you. I didn't do that. I did apologize because I'm a, I'm a big uh, advocate that if we want to actually experience the grace of God, we have to be able to share our brokenness with one another. And that's actually one of the things that I think is so beautiful about First Image is that it's not just inviting people that are broken into a place where they can find healing, but it's a willingness to recognize that we're all broken and we all need one another if we're going to navigate the insanity of the world in which we live that God has not lost his grip on his redemptive story, and that you are actually one of the ways that God is weaving in a new note into what feels like a hopeless situation that can bring about such beauty, such good, such transformation to just a single life. Um, it's all worth it. Me having conversations with a gentleman who liked my tattoos about tattoos, only for him to find out I'm a pastor, and then for him to text me at night and said, I think I'm ready to surrender to Jesus. We don't realize how little it takes to make someone feel seen. And I want you to know that God sees every little thing we do and he wants to use all of it. In spite of our mixture, he wants to use us to bring about beauty from ashes. Um, I, I wanna just ponder this idea of treasures of darkness for a second um, because I often have found um, that my own life, um, I just went through, I wrote my first book called Stumbling Toward Eternity, which is a reflection on the seven words of Jesus from the cross. But interspersed is a series of memoir fragments. And I was a kid who grew up with a single mom. My dad, uh, my dad was a lifelong um, alcohol, uh, alcoholic and drug user. Um, and 
about 10 years ago, um, I realized I hadn't talked to him in five years um, because he was such a curmudgeon and so difficult. And when, I found, when he found out I was a Christian, he even became more um, intolerable. Uh, and anytime I would try to talk with him, he'd start yelling at me or cussing at me. Um, so I stopped talking to him altogether. And then I'm leading his church, and we're like uh, 800 young adults coming to our church. And I'm this new spiritual father for all of them. And I, real, I read that stinking verse, uh, you know, honor your mother and father. You've read it, right? <laughs> honor your mother and father. And I'm like, why is there no contingency on this verse? <laughs> like, why, can't, why didn't it say honor your mom and dad if they were awesome? And then I, I realized the great, um, the great way to be healed of that kind of silly thinking is just to become a parent. And then you're like, I am so grateful there is no contingency on this verse. <laughs> but I, I had that, that deep conviction. I'm, I need to, I, I can't be in good conscience one who says, on your worst day, Jesus is crazy about you. And to hold out the hand of grace to broken people all around. I can't be a conduit of grace to some and, and refuse to be a conduit of grace to my dad. Um, and that conviction led to me reaching out to my father and becoming um, a, a, a person who recognized I'm never gonna get from my dad what you know kids who have good dads should grow up with. Um, he's not gonna be able to parent me at this point. He's super sick, he's in and out of ICU. His alcoholism is so insane that uh, you know, he drinks himself to drink himself in the jaundice, like he ruptured his esophagus. I think I flew up to Alaska four times thinking it was gonna be the last time I saw him. He, we joked, I'm like, Dad, you know you're like a cockroach, right? Like you can't be killed, it's insane, I don't understand. And he's like, I know, but I'm not over yet, son. <laughs> like, I know, and I, what I realized, the reason he was never dying is because Jesus wasn't finished with him. Um, and slowly my dad, because of my willingness to enter into his brokenness, recognizing I'm probably never gonna get an apology. In fact, I would say this, a year before my father died, he said to me, Joshua, I'm never gonna apologize for how I raised you. And I was like, I mean, I don't know why you would since you didn't raise me. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, he, and I go, Dad, like literally, I saw you like four times in my entire childhood. Like mom didn't even let me see you because you were that bad. And he goes, darn it, son. That wasn't the word he used. When I call you, I want to feel better, not worse than hung up on me. And I'm like, how, why, how is this my fault? Uh, and I, I, I'll never forget this moment in which I flew up to be with my dad. And there we are sitting in his single wide trailer and smoke, smoke filled, the ceilings are stained with cigarette, cigarette smoke. Uh, and I mean, he just, he literally, it's 40 below, so all the windows are shut, and I feel like I'm suffocating, I'm in hell. Um, my dad can't, couldn't walk, so he wasn't bathing himself, and, it, and he just left the TV running all the time that played like Bonanza and Little House on the Prairie because he said they were good people. It shows that it's not good that man be alone. He, even there, it's like a way of surrounding himself with, with something that felt like family. And he, here he is with a breathing tube in his nose, and he can't breathe. Um, and I bring up this incident with him um, about my earliest memory of remembering uh, my mom and dad fighting over me, and my dad had put me in a backseat of his car when he was drunk, and my mom was trying to stop him from taking me. Um, and it's my earliest memory. I remember my mom hitting him with rocks. Uh, and uh, I don't remember what happened after that. I have had to ask them. Um, but I bring it up with my dad, and my dad goes, you know, I'm still angry at you for that, Joshua. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, I'm angry that you didn't want to be with me. And I'm like, I was two. And he goes, I'm still angry. And then we stopped talking. And I was like, deeply upset. I'm like, how could he say that to me? What an absurd thing to say. And, it, and as I sat there and, and I, I looked over and I saw my dad was smoking a cigarette. He was sitting at this little table in the, in the dining room. He like would take his walker and just, just had enough energy to get to this little chair. He'd either sit there or in the recliner. And he's looking out the window at the darkness and the snow. And, uh, and something happened in me in that moment, like a, 
a, a softening. Because um, I saw my dad as he really was, as a man who, like everybody else, just wants to belong, wants to be loved. And I don't know what, what things happened to him as a child. I know he's fifth generation alcoholic. I have broke the cycle, praise God. Um, I'm the first preacher ever in the White family. It's still it's something incredible. Uh, I don't know if that's a comedic gesture on God's part or what, but there's my dad, and I just saw him like a little child. And I just found my heart kind of melted, and my tongue loosened, and I just said, I'm really sorry, Dad. I'm sorry that that hurt you so much. And he goes, it's okay, son. I don't know what's wrong with me. Your old man's usually tougher than this. And I said, I, said, I, I understand. And I'm like, I love you so much, Dad. And he goes, I love you too, son. And we kind of drifted back into the silence that marks my dad's interactions. He's like a very short man of few words. Um, and we watched Little House on the Prairie together. And I don't know if you guys, how many of you guys watched Little House on the Prairie? Probably a lot more of you than read The Cimmerillion. Uh, yeah. And it, there was an episode, I loved that show when I was a kid. Um, my mom loved it. It was an episode, one of the later seasons, when Pa Ingalls um, is in a field and he's praying. It's so weird that this was on. He's praying that um, God would save his son who's dying. Do you guys remember that episode? And an angel appears to him and tells him that his son's going to live. And I felt like this was like some strange portent in that moment. And I prayed that God would save my, son, my father the same way that he saved that son in that show. A year later, I get a call when I'm in Florida with the Luis Palau Association. And there's a man on the phone named Frank. And Frank goes, Josh, I'm a chaplain at the hospital in Soldotna. And I'm like, oh my gosh, my dad died. And he's like, you don't know me, but I've been talking with your dad for years about Jesus. Because he's, every time he's sick, he gets brought to the ICU, and that's the one time that he's sober. And so I've had your dad sober probably two dozen times. Let's just say that my dad went to church more than most of you, <laughs> uh, if you're anything like my congregation. It's like a once or twice a month kind of thing these days. Well, my dad drank just enough to put him in the hospital at least twice a month, which would lead to him getting a lot of unasked for church from Frank. And I go, oh my God, that makes so much sense. Every time I talk to my dad, he's all of a sudden using Christian vocabulary. And I'm like, I know I haven't ever shared that with him. I didn't know, I thought he was maybe getting it from Little House on the Prairie. Um, and, uh, and he goes, your dad prayed to receive Jesus today. And I was like, are you kidding me? And he goes, yeah. He goes, but I think you need to call him. I go, why is that? He goes, because he told me that he did, but he wasn't sure if it stuck. <laughs> and so I'm like, thanks for the call, Frank. So I call my dad. I'm like, dad, is it true? Do you pray to receive Jesus? And he goes, yeah, I prayed to receive Jesus. And I'm, he, I, go, I go, why do you say it like that? And he, and he said the exact words that Frank said. He goes, I'm not sure it stuck. <laughs> and I said, why do you think that? I go, never mind, let me, let, me think, let me answer for you. Is it because you can't walk anymore? Because you're still a raging alcoholic? Because you literally have lived a life that is not going to allow you to actually do anything ever again productive, and you're probably gonna die in the next couple years? And he was like, <laughs> he goes, thanks son for calling me. Um, and I go, I go, just answer my question. And he goes, yeah. I, I don't know why God would save me when I can't do anything. And I just said, Dad, I don't think you understand grace. I just want you to know that grace is this. The grace is, is love without contingency. It is a love that comes to you because it's God's nature to do so. God in his freedom has chosen to love you in your sin. And you said yes to that. And so I'm here to tell you that, your, that his grace is stickier than your doubt. And I know that with all my heart. And he goes, son, I believe you. And he goes, I've been praying to Jesus every day. And I said, that's awesome. And then he goes, can I ask you another question? I'm like, of course. And he goes, 
is it okay if I call him the big fella? <laughs> I'm like, I was re actually really troubled by that question. I didn't know as a pastor what was appropriate. Um, I said, <laughs> I go, let me think about that. I'm like, did you start with Jesus? And he goes, yes. I'm like, I think it's okay then. But as long as you started with Jesus, because I think of him as the big fella. Now here's the thing, my dad passed away last year, um, February of 22. I was at writer's block, I was having a hard time finishing my book, and I was stuck on the last chapter. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And I realize now that that writer's block that actually caused me to turn in my book a year late, which is really late, I don't recommend that, uh, um, was because my father's death was the last chapter. And in that last moments with him, um, I remember getting the call that he, they were going to have to put him on, on um, comfort care. And the concern was I wouldn't be able to make it in time to be with him when he died. But I just prayed. I'm like, Lord, I know I'm supposed to be there. And I got off the phone at 6 p.m. on a Wednesday night, and I was on an airplane in Seattle to Anchorage at 9.30 p.m. That's how fast I drove because I break the law always break the law. I believe in the spirit of the law. And in that night, it wasn't even the spirit. I didn't even believe in the spirit of it. Um, and uh, I get on the plane. I, I have to book another flight from Anchorage to Kenai. And I land in Kenai at 5.30 a.m. In a, in a blizzard. And I drive in this, from this blizzard to, uh, to the Soldatna Hospital. And there I am at my dad's side at 7, at 7 a.m. Uh, he's all cleaned up. He doesn't smell, his hair is combed. It's the best he's looked in years, probably a decade. Um, the nurses had taken care of him. The nurses all knew him by name. I would honestly say that these people function more like the church than churches generally function. Because whenever my dad showed up on, at death's door, they didn't ask questions, they didn't judge, they just loved him where he was at took care of him and did the best they could to make him comfortable, even when he would constantly ask the nurses didn't matter if they were young enough to be his granddaughters out on dates when he walked again. And just so you know what my dad looked like, he looked like a more haggard version of Willie Nelson. Um, and so uh, I, I, I'm next to his, his head. It's in the afternoon. And I play a song for him that I'd written. Um, and the moment he heard my voice, he began to cry. And he opened up his eyes. And he had been in kind of a coma, like, uh, not really responsive, uh, and he opened up his eyes and he looked right at me. Um, and I stood over his face and I put my hand on his cheek and I just began to feel this unbelievable weight that I was not prepared to watch my father suffocate to death. And I, and, and I, I want you guys to know that, that this is one of those things, this is a treasure of darkness. It's hard for me to still to get my head around because I don't think I could have bared the thought of not being with him. But in this moment, I'm like, what can I do? What can I do? I can't, he looks so scared. He's scared. He opens his eyes and he recognizes me and he just looks at me with this panic look, like, help me breathe. And I wanted to look away. And the Lord put it on my heart, just do not look away. And I looked into his eyes and I got as close to his face as I could. And I just said, Dad, I love you. And you're going to be okay. And Jesus is ready to receive you. And my dad got this crazy, peaceful look over his face. And he just watched me. And my song's playing on my phone next to his head. And he's, it's like he just started listening to the words of the, of the song. And his son, and I realized, I, I am doing something. I'm his son, and I'm here. I just, I'm here. I showed up. And, and, and I needed to be with him as much as he needed to be with me. And I watched my dad take his last breath 30 seconds before the song was over. And I can only describe to you, friends, as, yes, one of the most traumatic maybe things I've ever experienced, it also was one of the holiest moments of my life. Because in that moment, it reminded me, A, of the shortness of life, and at the same time, it's unbelievable gift that life does not surrender itself easily, <laughs> that 
that God has decreed that it is not good that man be alone, that we need one another, and that God can use the most insane things to bring about incredible, incredible outcomes. I would never have thought it is possible that Jesus would save Alexander White, but he saved him and he brought healing to our relationship. He taught me what it means to forgive, really forgive, and he showed me beyond the shadow of a doubt that on your worst day, Jesus is crazy about you. And this is the message that we need to be bringing to a world that is hurting. This is the message that First Image is bringing to countless young women. And it is Im just impacting women and children that may have not seen the light of day had it not been for First Image. But it's changing, it's literally changing the narrative for families. It's creating a whole new story. It's the way in which we participate in God's redemptive story. It's the way that we remind the world that he has not lost his grip and that it is still his story. And we know that the end is good, that the best is yet to come. So when I looked in my dad's dying eyes, I knew this is not the end, this is only the beginning for Alexander and that I will one day see him again. And that as painful as it was to lose him, to find him and for him to be found by Jesus and then to immediately lose him was so painful and at the same time the greatest gift I've ever been given. And I think that this is the kind of story uh, that is what First Image and many other organizations that we partner with. I love Shepherd's Door. I used to go teach the women at Shepherd's Door at least once a month for a couple of years. I loved it. Is that I love seeing God do radical, beautiful, redemptive things in unlikely, messy people like myself and you. And we have then the ability to take our broken histories and allow God to repurpose them to bring good and healing to other people's lives. This is the beauty of the gospel. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Christians right now, I think, are allowing fear to overcome them entering in to the gracious work of Jesus. Fear cannot rule us. The days are dark, but that just means the light is that much brighter where it shines. And I just would encourage you, have you allowed yourself to be a conduit of the greatest storyteller there ever was because you are a part of his story and he wants to infuse your story with his presence, with his grace, and he wants you to be a conduit of his love to hurting people all around you. Listen, we can't look away from our neighbor without looking away from the face of God and your neighbor is whoever is in front of you, beside you, behind you at any given moment in any given day. We have to ask ourselves, what is the goal of the Christian life? And I just simply will close with this. The goal of the Christian life is not sinning less, it's loving more. The goal of the Christian life is not arriving, it's knowing. Do you know Jesus? And do you know that you are loved by him? When we know that we are loved even on our worst days, that is the thing that makes me want to sin less. <laughs> when I recognize that I'm not, I don't need to climb a ladder because the gospel isn't a ladder to climb, it's a cross that we die on with Jesus. This is the good death. This is the treasure of darkness. This is the upside down kingdom. There are many people like Al, there are many, many mamas out there that are gonna be mamas and they're terrified. There are people all around us in our communities, family members, friends, that are hurting in ways that we can't even imagine. God is calling us out of our own self-absorption and he's saying, look out and see the wonder and the mystery of the world that I still love and have not lost my grip on. And he is inviting us in very practical ways to be the very physical manifestation of his invisible presence. Are you making Jesus known in your realm of influence? How many of you have an Alexander White or someone like that in your life, the person that seems outside of God's reach? I promise you, no one is outside of the reach of Jesus. So let us be his hands and feet. He loves you and he will bring treasures out of darkness. Amen? Amen? Let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the gospel and its ability to bring transformation to our lives. 
My prayer right now is that every person here would feel the crushing need around us, that we would feel in the depths of our beings the ways that people hurt. But Lord, even more than that, I pray that we would feel your grace, that we would take your yoke upon us because your work is also the very means by which we discover the freedom that you give to us. It's the freedom to do what is right, the freedom to be conduits of your love, the recognition that you're not looking for perfection. What you are looking for is surrender. And Lord, we wanna to surrender to you and we wanna be your hands and feet. And so, Jesus, would you give us the eyes to see people the way that you see them? And Lord, let us never lose hope, for as long as there is breath in our lungs, there is hope. And I thank you, Jesus, for my brothers and sisters here who have heard your call and are wanting to, do, to participate in whatever way they can in bringing healing to a hurting world. And so I pray over this ministry, and I pray that you would provide all that is necessary that many, many people would come to know the love of Jesus through what is being done through First Image. And we pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, guys. Amen.